all of you who are here on time, thank you. Good morning, welcome. Before we actually get started, let's take just a moment of silence to remember Congressman John Lewis, who is a hero to so many of us and who will be laid to rest later this morning. Again, thank you so much for joining the International Fund for Animal Welfare this morning to talk about the actions that led to COVID-19 and how we can protect against future pandemics. IFA is based in the United States with 15 offices around the world and programs on the ground in more than 40 countries internationally. We work at the intersection between humans and animals, supporting and empowering communities to coexist with and value native wildlife innovating solutions to human wildlife conflict, and working to stop wildlife crime. We also released a report this week, Beyond COVID-19, Preserving Human Health by Reinventing Our Relationship with Wildlife, which is available online and which we will send around after this briefing. We're all aware of the challenges our country and the global community face as a result of COVID-19. Many of us are focused, as we must be, on addressing the immediate needs triggered by the pandemic, like testing, protective equipment, healthcare resources, and economic needs. But even as you here today work on those very real and very urgent issues, we also need to look at what got us to this place and what we can do to prevent being here again in the future. We're living in a pivotal moment in human history. It's a painful time, but it's also an opportunity to look at what we're doing and make real changes that can have positive impact going forward. We have a fabulous panel of experts here today to tell you more about what we can do. But before we get started, some brief housekeeping issues. At the bottom of your Zoom window, you will see icons including a Q&A and raise hand buttons. Anyone can submit written questions through the Q&A function, so please feel free. And if you want to ask a verbal question, click on the raise hand icon. We will do our best to get to every question, but we do want to prioritize our congressional and agency attendees for verbal questions. And we ask that when you speak, you give your name and office. With that, let me introduce our guests. First, we have Dr. Robert Watson, former chair of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or IPBES and author of the 2019 Global Report on Biodiversity and Eco Ecosystem Services, which found that as many as 1 million species are at risk of extinction. Next, we have Dr. Yvette Johnson Walker, who is a veterinarian and epidemiologist. She is on the faculty at the University of Illinois Urbana-Campaign College of Veterinary Medicine in the Center for One Health and at the University of Illinois Chicago School of Public Health. She is the co-editor of Beyond One Health, From Recognition to Results, published in March of 2018 by Wiley Blackwell Publishing. And finally, we have Dr. Aaron Bernstein, co-director of the Center for Climate Health and the Global Environment at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and a pediatrician at Boston Children's Hospital. As you listen this morning, I encourage you to think beyond mere reactions to COVID-19 beyond the bounds of business as usual, and challenge yourselves to think about really transforming our current systems to address not only our immediate issues, but to better prepare us going forward. With that, I turn it over to Dr. Watson. Bob. Thank you. First, let me say it's a true pleasure to be able to contribute to this congressional briefing this morning. Let me state the obvious. The situation is urgent. Coordinated actions, both nationally and internationally, are needed to address the current pandemic, but even more important, to reduce the likelihood of future pandemics and to be better prepared when they occur. While nature and a stable environment is absolutely essential for human well being, the COVID 19 pandemic demonstrates the vulnerability of peoples around the world to zoonotic diseases due to our unsustainable interactions with nature. 
Zoonotic diseases are well known to be a significant threat to human health. And pandemics such as COVID-19 have long been predicted by the scientific committee and should come as no surprise. It's estimated that 75% of all new infectious diseases in humans have their origin in animals, predominantly, but not exclusively, wildlife, the rest from domesticated animals. And domesticated animals can often act as a bridge between humans and human infection. It's estimated out of 1.6 million potential viruses in mammals and birds, 700,000 could pose a risk to human health. Therefore, just as COVID-19 is not the first pandemic arising from animals, recent pandemics include a zoonotic influ influenza, bird flu, SARS, MERS, and Ebola. And this will not be the last. The incidence of zoonotic diseases appears to be increasing. Hence the urgent need to take preventative actions now based on the best scientific knowledge to manage the risks. The operative word is prevention. The underlying causes of the most zoonotic infectious diseases include agricultural intensification of birds and animals with very poor biosafety standards. Wildlife use and misuse, such as wet markets, again, with poor biodiversity biosafety standards. And human-induced landscape change, for example, deforestation for domestic livestock farm. This brings together domesticated animals and humans into contact with wildlife. Each of these provides a risk of the spread of viruses from wild animals to humans, both directly and indirectly. We need to monitor the encroachment of humans into previously pristine natural ecosystems. We need to monitor the illegal trade of animals and improve the biosafety of wet markets, as these are indeed the predominant pathways for future pathogen transmission, thus the potential of future zoonoses and pandemics. Early warning systems, rapid identification of the disease, exchange of information, and preparedness at the national level and the international level are all needed. And in the case of COVID-19, we're all lacking, both in the US and around the world. Our interconnected world makes the likelihood of a local outbreak of a zoonotic disease become a global pandemic much higher than in earlier times, when the world was less interconnected by international travel. In spite of the repeated predictions of COVID-19 pandemics and the general consensus that prevention is better than cure, investments and political will to control them at source has been sadly lacking. But we need to look at the really big picture. As noted earlier, the problem of zoonotic pandemics is embedded in our unsustainable relationship with nature. The big issues are loss of biodiversity, deforestation, for example, climate change, land degradation, and air and water pollution. Land use change is not only a potential source of zoonotic diseases, it also is a leading cause of the loss of biodiversity and the degradation of ecosystem services, which are absolutely essential for human well being. There is also a view that climate change may exacerbate zoonotic diseases. Therefore, there is an urgent need to address the loss of biodiversity and climate change for multiple reasons. They are both undermining human well-being for current and future generations. This will require transformative change. We need inclusive governance systems around the world. We need an evolution of our economic and financing systems. We need multi-sectoral planning and implementation. No longer can we think of agriculture being separate from energy, transportation, tourism, economic systems. We also need to rethink what is the definition of the good, a good quality of life. We need to base all of our actions on improved 
scientific understanding of these very complex issues. Given the economic and social havoc caused by COVID-19, we now have a unique opportunity nationally and internationally that addresses the socioeconomic impacts of the current pandemic and reduces the threat and improved preparedness of future pandemics. We need to design a COVID, post-COVID-19 recovery plan that promotes an economic development that is sustainable and equitable. We need to invest in green, low-carbon infrastructure, conserving and restoring biodiversity, and developing sustainable agricultural practices. These will be good to minimize the potential of future pandemics. They'll also be good for the economy, jobs, human health, and the environment. There is no time to waste. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. We're gonna hold questions for the end, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Johnson Walker now. Well, good morning, and I'd like to thank IFAW for inviting me to participate, and I'd like to thank each of you for joining in our discussion this morning. And as you listen to the uh, talks from uh, Dr. Watson, Dr. Bernstein, and myself, you'll notice that there are certain themes that keep reappearing in each of these talks, and so uh, I hope we'll take these messages to heart. Uh, the CDC recognizes that the health of uh, people is connected to the health of animals and the health of the environment. And this is often referred to as the concept of one health, but this really isn't a new idea. You can look back uh, to the early 1800s when uh, Chief Seattle quoted about the interdependence of humans, animals, and the environment and said, what is man without the beasts? For if all the beasts were gone, man would die of a great loneliness of the spirit. Or you can look to John Muir in the early 1900s, who's known as the father of national parks, who said when one tugs at a single thing in nature, he finds it attached to the rest of the world. And so there really has been for quite some time an understanding that this relationship between human health, animal health, and environmental health is really interdependent. And although our focus today is on infectious disease, One Health really isn't simply about infectious disease spillovers into, from animals to humans. It really considers our shared environment and those shared exposures that we have and the impact of the built environment on humans, animals, and the ecosystems that we share. So when ecosystems function correctly, they provide direct benefits to humans and animals, such as clean air and water, food, products for shelter, religious and cultural practices, health and medicine. But human activities such as habitat conversion and wildlife over exploitation really are among the drivers of biodiversity loss. They act as long-term stressors, decreasing the resilience of these systems and leading to degradation of ecosystem function. And in many cases, we'll find multiple drivers acting upon those ecosystems synergistically and compounding the impact of each uh, driver alone. And loss of those biodiversity, uh, biodiverse ecosystems results in vulnerability to natural and man-made disasters and increases the risk of spillover events in which infectious diseases move from wildlife reservoirs into human populations. And emerging infectious disease of wildlife threaten human bio health, biodiversity, and the economies when those diseases impact livestock. So some examples of the impact of habitat conversion Human encroachment on wildlife habitats, so residential sprawl into wildlife habitats results in pets and humans having contact with wildlife. Agricultural production in those wildlife habitats results in domestic livestock having contact with wildlife and then agricultural workers having contact with those domestic animals and the wildlife. And so those increase the opportunities for wildlife spillover events into domestic animal and human populations. An example of this we see in Nipah virus, which was identified in 1999 in Malaysia and Singapore. Encroachment of swine farms into wildlife habitats brought pigs in close contact with bats, which were the reservoir for Nipah virus. 
The pigs developed mild respiratory illness, but then the humans working with those pigs developed more severe encephalitis and influenza-like illnesses. And in that initial outbreak out of 300 human cases, there were 100 fatalities associated with Nipah virus. And now we see that Nipah virus since 2001 has reappeared repeatedly in Bangladesh and India. In these outbreaks, uh, agricultural uh, swine production was not involved in those spreads, but instead foodborne spread through consumption of date palm wine that was contaminated by fruit bats. And so again, bats being the reservoir and people then being exposed to those bats becoming infected. And as with many spillover events, those initial cases from wildlife resulted then in substantial human to human transmission after the spillover event resulting in larger outbreaks. But you don't have to go that far away to see this example of human encroachment on wildlife habitats resulting in disease. Right here in the US, Lyme disease, first identified in 1975 in Lyme, Connecticut, has been attributed in large part to former agricultural land that had become reforested, then being developed for suburban residential use. And so bringing humans and pets in contact with uh, deer ticks and wildlife carrying those deer ticks and then being exposed to Lyme disease. And so now it's endemic in the US with about 30,000 cases being reported annually to the CDC although this is thought to be a vast underestimated uh, number of cases with the expectation being that there are more like 300,000 cases occurring per year in the United States of Lyme disease. Overexploitation of wildlife is obvious in many ways. We can see the legal global trade in wildlife involving the movement of millions of plants and billions really of plants and animals uh, with an economic value estimated at about 300 billion US dollars. In addition, the illegal wildlife trade is estimated to be an additional five to $20 billion industry, uh, similar to the industry we see with illegal drug transportation and weapons trade. And in fact, the US imported over 11 billion individual animal species between 2000 and 2013. And most of this was for the aquatic and pet industry, resulting in about a third of all of those shipments containing live animals and according to the traders reports, the vast majority of those, about 78% were listed as wild caught animals. And the demand is increasing. During that 2000 to 2013 year period of time, the number of shipments declared actually doubled. And according to the AVMA's most recent data, about 13% of US households owns a specialty or exotic pet at the end of the year 2016. And that represents a 25% increase from 2011. And so these trends really reinforce the need to scale up capacity for border inspections, risk management protocols, and disease surveillance. Examples, uh, the only known outbreak of monkeypox in the US happened in 2003. There are over 70 human cases of monkeypox reported to the CDC occurring in six different Midwestern states. And this outbreak was traced back to an Illinois exotic pet dealer who housed imported Gambian pouched rats and prairie dogs together. The rats were carriers of the monkeypox who then transmitted it to the prairie dogs as the prairie dogs were sold for pets, their owners, veterinary staff, and pet shop employees were then exposed to monkeypox. But then it's not just the exotic pet trade. Activities associated with human consumption of wildlife also pose a risk of transmission and spread of infectious disease. And so when we think of diseases such as HIV, Ebola, SARS, and our current COVID-19 pandemic, these are examples that we see of outbreaks of human disease that may have resulted from spillover events traced back to human consumption of wildlife. And so these are really complex problems. And the question becomes, what can a legislative body do to affect change? And so I have a couple of suggestions of things that can be implemented at a policy stage that can help resolve some of these issues. One is the support for the need for an enhanced, integrated One Health surveillance system within the US and at a global level. Systems that are collecting, correlating, and analyzing real-time data from humans, domestic animals, and wildlife populations, while incorporating some environmental data, such as weather, geography, and potential chemical and physical exposures. 
Right now, our disease surveillance systems are often unrelated, uncorrelated, and there's very little disease surveillance happening for wildlife populations. And they may be the first sentinels that we see for predictors of future pandemics. And so the need to look at what's happening, not just in human populations or looking at diseases impacting trade and domestic animal populations, but looking at those shared diseases across all of the populations, human, domestic animal, and wildlife. Secondly, we have to consider the funding structure, whether it's for policy, rulemaking, legislation, or even grant funding, usually funds that are allocated for human health have no relationship to what's happening in animal health or wildlife or ecosystem health, and they're completely different silos. So that current structure in which each of those are considered in isolation and without regard to the impact of the others really uh, limits our ability to take a holistic approach to what's happening with the health of all three sectors. And so stakeholders focused on environmental health policy are often at odds with those involved in agricultural production. And those working in human health are often not considering at all the impact on environmental health or animal health. And so we need to foster working across those subject matter or institutional silos and develop interdisciplinary collaboration for those agencies to fund research activities scoring through a One Health lens so that we can essentially insist that policies or programs address at least two of the three legs of the triad in giving highest priority to those that seek to enhance the health of all three. And that same approach can be applied with result to international development activities. Conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity is really imperative for continued functioning of ecosystems and human health. So we should seek opportunities for synergistic approaches that promote both biodiversity and con conservation and the health of humans. So this includes sustainable development goals and targets addressing health, food and fresh water security, climate change and biodiversity loss. Investing and in implementing policies that are driven at the local level to actively prevent, detect and respond to disease and emerging disease threats. And so an example of this type of policy implementation was the Global Health Security Agenda launched in 2014. And so in conclusion, policy initiatives really must have specific objectives to guide the reduction of disease burden among animal and human populations and biodiversity conservation. If we fail to do that, the threat of emerging infectious diseases will persist. A holistic One Health approach to prevention of disease promotes and maintains health and saves society's financial and material resources. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Dr. Bernstein, we now turn it over to you. Thank you, Kate, and I'd like to thank IFA as well for the opportunity to speak today. It's an honor to share the webinar with my fellow panelists, Dr. Johnson Walker and, and Professor Watson. And I'm also grateful to all of those who are um, here with us. Um, for those who are staff on the Hill, there's always a million things going on and the priorities of the day couldn't be more urgent in any number of ways. But I think it's critical that you're here because it turns out that ignoring the issue of today's session uh, will turn out to undermine any other priority you would like to see achieved. And so I think it behooves us all to think deeply about that question, which is, if you really want to improve health for Americans, if you really want to stabilize our economy, if you want to deal with injustice in this country, it turns out as you care about any of those things, if we ignore this problem, which is the threat of emerging infections, uh, we'll, we'll essentially compromise on that promise. Um, I'd like to make four points to you uh, today. Uh, the first is will resonate with what you've heard before, but I want to give it a slightly different slant, which is we must save nature to save ourselves. The second is that our salvation comes cheap, far cheaper uh, than you may realize. The third is that we tend to radically underestimate the value of the actions we need to take to save ourselves. And the last thing I would do today is make a call to action for us all. So 
how do we save ourselves through saving nature? Well, I hope that's abundantly clear from what you've heard from my fellow panelists. But I can tell you as a pediatrician, as someone who's cared for children with the disease, including this rare, bizarre, horrible, inflammatory disease that afflicts children after they've been infected, uh, I've seen the devastation it causes to children, families, and communities. And I can tell you with great confidence that this pandemic uh, is not only a problem for everyone who gets it, it's a problem for everyone's health. Uh, we have already seen a record number of closures of health facilities in this country in the past year. And COVID is not just killing Americans, it's killing American health care. And if we, we simply cannot sustain another shock to the healthcare system of anything close to this magnitude and expect to have care available, particularly to rural Americans and particularly to poor Americans who are already suffering from some of the worst access to healthcare we've seen in generations. You've heard that uh, from Drs. Johnson Walker and Professor Watson, that emergence of infectious diseases is really an issue of how we do business we humans do business with the rest of the biosphere. And so when we talk about prevention, as Professor Watson mentioned, we have to really look at how we engage with nature. Uh, I've been a part of a team of ecologists, economists, wildlife conservations, infectious disease experts who worked over the past several months uh, and just published a paper last week in Science uh, which lays out what we need to do in the realm of prevention of emerging infections uh, to forestall the next pandemic and how much it will cost to do that. And what we learned is that our, our salvation comes cheap. We estimated that the cost of reducing deforestation in the tropics by half, and deforestation, as you've heard, is, is the major driver of uh, biodiversity loss in the world, climate change is giving it some competition these days, uh, through greater surveillance of wildlife, like uh, Dr. Johnson Walker was talking about, managing the wildlife trade more wisely. The things you've heard from my fellow panelists will cost somewhere around 20 to $30 billion a year. That seems like a lot of money until you put it in comparison to what we've outlaid for this one, one disease which is upwards now of $10 trillion. If we were to spend 20 to $30 billion every year for a decade to save ourselves and save nature, we'll only have spent on the order of a few percent of the total cost of this one infection. Our salvation is a bargain we can't afford to not take. Even with that cost benefit, it turns out that we're radically underestimating the value of these actions. Protecting tropical forests will help us forestall the next pandemic, but it also, of course, will prevent massive amounts of greenhouse gases being released into the atmosphere, which we estimate in our analysis to be on the order of about $4 billion a year. In our paper, we didn't even consider the value of the tens, and in some cases, hundreds of thousands of people who die every year from smoke that comes from the fires that are set to burn down the forests, usually for agriculture in parts of the year. Nor did we account, nor could anyone possibly account, for the value of protecting the lands of indigenous peoples uh, who live in these forests, uh, to protecting those forests from destruction. And lastly, we did not account for the reality that the diseases like COVID-19 thrive on poverty. They thrive on inequality and they make poverty and inequality much worse. Left unfettered, emerging infections like COVID thwart all of our shared goals of providing for a more just and sustainable world. So with that, I'd like to make a call to action for all of the staffers uh, on this call. I urge you to work together and connect the dots between conservation, zoonotic disease, this pandemic and the viability of healthcare in the United States. Americans care about healthcare. They may not care about wildlife in the tropics, but if we can show them that if they expect to go to a doctor and get care for their diabetes, to get care for a heart attack that their loved one has, that to ignore this is to essentially say we're giving up on their healthcare. We have to make this issue real to the American people in ways that they can understand. 
We have to recognize that conservation policies here and around the world are climate policies, they're healthcare policies, they are pandemic prevention policies. And most importantly, they're policies that can keep us all doing what we should be doing, going to school, going to work, and focusing on the needs of so many that have been neglected already because of this pandemic. Very happy to take any of your questions as we move into Q&A. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Bernstein, Dr. Johnson Walker, and Dr. Watson for all of your very compelling remarks. I know that there are going to be many questions from our attendees. Before we move to those, I just wanted to say, you know, as many of you know, the U.S. is a thriving market for trade in wildlife products. But unfortunately, we are also steadily degrading habitat, biodiversity, and wildlife protections. And as our panelists have demonstrated, these are all risk factors for the emergence of new zoonotic diseases and spillover into human populations. In order to help prevent the next pandemic, the U.S. must take action at the federal level to reduce wildlife trade and contact between wildlife and people. We must maintain and upgrade protections for both wildlife and habitat, and as many have said, invest in monitoring of potential disease emergence risk. We must also understand the drivers of wildlife trade and habitat destruction and aim to address them using a one health and one welfare approach. IFA's specific recommendations for the US are number one, funding. Funding not only supports critical programs, it also signals what we prioritize as a na nation. Funding is needed now to protect conservation gains around the world. And then, as Dr. Bernstein said so eloquently, it's needed consistently into the future. COVID-19 is an object lesson in what happens when we fail to prioritize our natural world, specifically to protect wildlife. I will note here that at least one recent study valued annual global terrestrial ecosystem services. That's just ecosystem services on land. And those are the benefits we as people derive from healthy ecosystems like clean air, disaster resilience, and potable water as roughly equivalent to annual global GDP. And of course, wildlife is an integral, necessary part of healthy ecosystems. So our well-being is inextricably linked with the well-being of animals and our natural world. And nature is already more than paying its own way. If we continue to fail in protecting animals and habitats, the social and economic price of that failure will continue to rise. But while funding is important and critical, we have to take other steps as well. One would be to adopt a preventative approach to trade in species. That is a green list that allows only species that we know to be safe to be traded. We must reduce commercial trade in wildlife, including live wild animals and their parts and products, eliminate wildlife trafficking, close wild animal markets and reduce consumer demand. That's key, reduce consumer demand for wildlife products and for wild animals as pets. We need to strengthen conservation laws and prioritize their enforcement, support wildlife and habitat friendly e infrastructure development and ensure wild habitats remain connected so biodiversity can thrive. We must incorporate a One Health approach as Dr. Johnson Walker said, into conservation and public health policies and establish and support longitudinal interdisciplinary, pardon me, interdisciplinary global research programs to understand and track wildlife biomes and related human health factors. And of course, we must address poverty and associated problems, including food and resource insecurity that contribute to habitat destruction wildlife exploitation and biodiversity loss. Before we open up to questions from the audience, I have a couple of questions that I'd like to use to get the ball rolling with our panelists. First, what is one thing that you wish everyone knew about COVID-19 but think that you do not, that they do not? Um, and I'll start perhaps with Dr. Watson 
if that's okay. I think very simply, most people don't understand the potential origins of a pandemic such as COVID-19. They don't understand that actually it's related to conserving and restoring biodiversity and it's potentially related to climate change. So I don't think they understand the interrelationship between this pandemic, other pandemics and nature. Thank you. Dr. Johnson Walker. I think uh, when we talk about zoonotic disease, we, we always focus on movement from the animal to the person or from the animal population to the human population. Uh, one thing that we are starting to just beginning to learn about COVID-19 are the number of species that are susceptible to the disease who've, uh, who've contracted it through their contact with people. And so we've identified uh, domestic cats and uh, large cats in zoo facilities and mink in facilities that were exposed to people who were carrying COVID-19 and then they eventually developed the virus. There's been no evidence documented clearly to date that those animals then retransfer it back to people. Uh, but understanding that the health of humans impacts the health of animal populations and that potentially these animals can serve as a source of infection to either other animals or continued contact and exposure to the virus over time. And so we're going to have to look at what happens over time as humans begin to contaminate animal populations with this virus and potentially become a source of the disease uh, long term. Thank you very much. Dr. Bernstein. Sure. Well, I think everybody knows they never want to do anything like this again. I think the thing that isn't as clear is that we don't have to. And right now everyone is focused on a vaccine and, and I think the vaccine is obviously going to be great if and when it happens uh, and works. <laughs> uh, but the reality is we can't vaccinate our way out of pandemic emergence. There's no guarantee that the vaccines we develop will work. There's no guarantee they'll be safe, uh, but we know how to prevent these things. And why would we spend trillions of dollars after a disaster has happened and then make a vaccine when we could spend, you know, orders of magnitude less to simply not have to deal with them at all? I think that's a really important message with all this focus on the vaccines and all the money that can be made and who's going to profit and all of this stuff. We, we, this is a conversation we shouldn't even be having. Uh, we should be having a conversation about how to stop these things from happening in the first place. Thank you. I see we have a couple of questions coming in from our audience, but very quickly, I wanted to ask you as well. It's easy for us all to become paralyzed when we're living through this sort of painful moment that we are living through now with COVID-19. But what is the most hopeful thing that you are seeing come out of our conversations around COVID-19? Or to put it another way, what are you most op optimistic about right now? And uh, Dr. Johnson Walker, can I start with you on, on this question? Sure, I think um, one of the things that this pandemic has served to teach us all is how interconnected we really all are. And that there's no such thing as a foreign disease, disease that appears in one part of the world within 24 hours can quickly be in any other part of the world. Uh, and that the, the, that the people who do the hidden work of society uh, need to be valued more, that, that we've had to reframe what it means to be an essential worker. And it means everything from being a physician or a nurse, but then also to being a sanitation worker or someone who's harvesting food in the fields or working at an abattoir. And so hopefully we'll appreciate those workers and begin looking at ways that we can ensure they all have a living wage and that their jobs uh, have enough job safety to protect their health and welfare because we see that society doesn't function well without any of its essential workers and and 
education and income aren't necessarily the indicators of what's an essential worker. Thank you. Dr. Bernstein, what are you most optimistic about now? Um, well, there's a bunch of stuff. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's always a challenge to talk about being optimistic when we're dealing with so much terrible stuff right now. And, you know, the question is, is, is a good one to, to give some attention to despite the, the mess that, that's happening right now. You know, I, I think there's, there's two things. One is that what we saw in this country as COVID-19 unfolded uh, was a real test of whether Americans believe in science or trust science, probably better stated, or not. And I think what's been very clear is that pretty much everybody trusts science. And, and that's really cause for hope. You know, we could have embraced witchcraft. We could have embraced alchemy. We could have embraced all kinds of off the wall ideas. And, you know, of course there will always be people who embrace off the wall ideas, but almost everybody said, you know, let's look at what the people who know something about this are saying. Uh, who's done the research? Who spent their career studying these things? Who, who have federal taxpayer dollars supported to do research? And, and that's really cause for hope and optimism. The, the second is, is, is something that, I, that uh, Dr. Johnson Walker alluded to, you know, the, the, what this uh, pandemic did for many Americans it, it is reveal festering and awful problems that were inapparent. Racism being a prime example. And I think by the pain that the pandemic caused, in some ways enabled people to see more clearly what has been so obvious to many people for so long. And that with that experience, I'm actually optimistic that we can make much more progress that is long overdue on, on pushing towards equality. I certainly hope so, thank you. Uh, Dr. Watson. Yeah, I'm much less optimistic about the US unless Congress really takes the bull by the horns and actually moves us in the right direction. If I listen to the administration, I have no reason to be optimistic at all. It's not at all obvious they've learned anything from this pandemic. And therefore, there really is an opportunity to do something different with our economic stimulus packages. The European Union stimulus package clearly has major elements on a green economy, creating green jobs addressing biodiversity. So I'm very optimistic that at least many of the countries in Europe do recognize this as an opportunity for the right sort of sustainable policies in the future. I'm very optimistic that many of our governors in the US are indeed understanding the dilemma. But boy, I really hope that Congress and people listening to this briefing will really listen that we have a serious problem and there are real opportunities to do things differently in the future. Indeed, thank you. So I'm gonna take move to our first question from the audience. What is the best way to communicate to Americans the interconnectedness, interconnectedness of human health to the health of the environment and wildlife? While I see these connections, to some, this may seem like a stretch. Uh, Dr. Bernstein, do you want to start us out on that? Sure. I, you know, I think I, I spend half my life directly caring for people and half my life caring for the nature upon which everyone's health depends. And having thought about this question a lot, I can say the thing we need to think clearly about is meeting people where they're at. We, we should not expect, nor I think is it reasonable to expect that any person in this country or frankly anywhere in the world would care about an animal halfway around the world before caring about themselves. And so if you wanna connect this issue to the, mind, you know, to the minds of Americans, we need to focus on what they're concerned about right now. We need to focus on the concerns about healthcare. We need to focus on the concerns about jobs. We need to focus on the concerns about equity. And the truth is that all of those things are in play 
uh, we, we cannot build a bridge. We cannot pretend there's a bridge between those concerns and, and the concerns of this session uh, without starting where people are at. And, and the good news is that because, as I mentioned in the opening part of my remarks, that this issue is really a factor in pretty much anything you'd care about and any American cares about, that bridge can be built, but it needs to be built before we can expect people in elected office to reflect those values, uh, for uh, an administration to be elected that would care about these values. Um, and, I th and I think that's critical. We have to start where people's concerns are right now. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Watson or Dr. Johnson Walker, would either of you care to weigh in on that question? I, yeah, I think this is Bob. Um, I, it, I think now is the time to actually have a short documentary done in the same way David Attenborough does these wonderful documentaries about nature, the value of nature. I think a short documentary, uh, 15 minutes, half an hour maximum, played at prime time on television to show the relationship between nature and humans. Uh, the good things that we get from nature really stress the positive things, uh, food, water, etc. the way it controls our climate. Also show, however, the, how we can get pandemics by inadvertently uh, react, working with nature in a bad way, deforestation, etc. So I think we do need to educate the public I think we need to put it in the much broader picture of biodiversity, nature generally, and climate change, and clearly bring in the sort of issues that Aaron has just spoken about. And I would say, I think one of the other challenges is we, we need to start at the level of interprofessional communication, and that veterinarians, physicians, ecologists, agriculturalists, need to share and communicate with each other. And then as they work with, each of them works with the general public in terms of education in that field and bridging some of those relationships. It's important that physicians understand that the health of the entire family is interdependent, including the pets. It's important that veterinarians understand that the treatments and medications they give to the pets have an impact on the entire family and then we need to consider the impact of ourselves and our pets and our households on the environment and how we affect each other as kind of the starting point and then starting to move toward what does this mean globally and what does this mean in terms of those relationships with animals on another continent. But uh, one of the challenges are is those silos that we live in that as professionals we don't communicate very much and don't share that we've got shared values and that the impact of what one of us does affects the other sectors too. Thank you. Uh, that's a really, it's a point well taken. And I, I wanna just say that for congressional staff who have joined us, you may have noticed as you talk to your colleagues in your office that the invitation we sent today went out to a whole host of staff members, those handling healthcare, those handling the environment, those handling animal welfare, appropriations, um, legislative affairs more generally. And that was not an accident. As Dr. Johnson Walker just said, we need to be collaborating more interdisciplinary and in an interdisciplinary ma manner. I was about to make up a new word there. Um, and we hope that for those staff members who are able to join today, if others in your offices who work on related issues, whether healthcare, the environment, or animal welfare, were not able to attend, we do hope you'll share a link to this briefing uh, later on, because this is an important topic for all of us, regardless of the specific aspects of our portfolios. Um, so moving on to another question, this is from Peter Jenkins of Public Employees for Environmental Responsibility, or PEER. Thank you, Peter. His question is, isn't the most rapid and lowest cost important step that all nations can take to emulate what Vietnam has recently announced? 
a flat ban on any cross-border trade in wild animals, particularly in wild mammals and wild birds, at least until a green list approach could be implemented. Um, well, who would like to start with this? I, I know from our discussions that each of our panelists has, has an opinion on this. Um, Dr. Watson, would you like to start? Sure. In fact, uh, many, many NGOs and many other scientists have called for a complete ban on all wildlife trade, completely shutting down wildlife markets, Obviously, all illegal trade, which is covered under the CITES, should absolutely be banned. And we need to enforce all regulations to limit illegal trade. Um, however, rather than go for a blanket ban on all wet markets, one step should at least be that we improve the environmental conditions and the buyer safety. So a significant improvement uh, in these so-called wet markets. If we do ban the wet markets, we've got to make sure there's, there's money for training people, that there's alternative source of protein, and we have to recognize there are cultural issues associated with some of these wildlife markets, especially in Southeast Asia. So I think we need to look at all of the opportunities of how to limit uh, wildlife trade, wet markets in, as a source of indeed infectious diseases but i think we need to study a little bit more before we take the hammer approach of just saying we must close all of them uh, like vietnam has done at least temporarily and my concern with simply having the blanket closure is that you'll drive uh, the business more underground and then there'll be no opportunity for regulation and understanding about conservation and sustainable uh, use of wildlife. And so while we'd like to eventually perhaps move toward in that direction, I think starting with a simple out and out ban may just push activity underground that there's already a substantial market with illegal wildlife trade and uh, I'd hate to uh, incentivize illegal wildlife trade because right now the illegal trade is already uh, poorly regulated. And uh, so I'd hate to do anything that makes that worse. And so if we can, as an intermediate step, work on setting standards in terms of sanitation, biosecurity, training and educating of people who are involved in those trades and, and looking at ways that they can do it more sustainably and in a humane, more humane fashion, I think that would perhaps start moving us toward our end goal without potentially increasing that illegal market. Thank you. Dr. Bernstein, do you have anything to add on that question? Not on that one. Okay. Thank you. And I will just say from IFA's perspective, um, we are focused on green listing because for a number of reasons, but among them we see that as a very high bar. Um, and we also see that as putting the onus for demonstrating um, safety on the people who are seeking to benefit from a particular uh, trade, trade issue. Whereas now um, people who are benefiting from trade in wildlife are externalizing costs onto the broader public through things like pandemics um, or more isolated illnesses. Um, habitat destruction and other things that we've all talked about here today, if we put the onus of the people engaged in trade to demonstrate that not only is the species safe, but particular animals are well cared for in any sort of trade, um, any capture of animals is safe not only for the animals, but for the habitat, then we are really creating a full paradigm shift away from our current system of allowing trade in everything until we discover to our 
peril that that trade is unsafe, as in what's happened with COVID-19. Now, I know we just have a few moments left. We have another question. Um, is there a risk that action to address wildlife consumption and trade without attending to broader questions of ecosystem health and human intrusion on nat natural habitat? Uh, do we focus on the point of the spear or the factory that produces the spear? I, th I think that goes back to to wanting to take a needing to take a one health approach that we can't look at wildlife in absence of looking at human health and poverty and and then ecosystem health that we've got to take a holistic look that that addresses all three that we're looking at the factory that makes the spear and the point of the spear at the same time and trying to improve the quality for all of them because it's not going to be sustainable. If we only focus on humans, it's not going to be sustainable to the wildlife and the environment. And if we only focus on those, if we ignore the needs of humans, then people aren't going to follow the policies and mandates, but, and it won't be sustainable in that way either. And, and so that's really why we need that interdisciplinary approach that considers the impact of the actions on one to all of the three tiers of humans, animals, and the environment. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Watson, Watson or Dr. Bernstein, do you have anything to add? No, I think the last answer was a very good one. There's enough knowledge about pandemics, the origin of pandemics, what we need to do to reduce the risk of a spread of an outbreak of a zoonotic disease, but it does need interdisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity. We need to get together in one place, all of the key players that can look what needs to be done nationally to minimize the risk to the US. How do we, if we do get a pandemic, how do we handle it correctly? But we must do this internationally. We must work with the WHO. We're moving away from WHO is crazy. We need to work with the Convention on Biodiversity, of which the US is not a member. And we need to work with other countries on climate change. So we need to bring together people at both the national and international level, assess the full range of options all the way down the causal chain, and make sure we understand what unintended consequences could be, as well as synergistic responses. Thank you. Dr. Bernstein, do you want to add to? Well, I don't, I think those answers uh, cover the basis for sure. I, I think there's another question here, which given the time I might give a quick response to, which is the question of, you know, do we need another federal bureaucracy? Should the NIH reprioritize? And, and I think these kind of questions and the calls for interdisciplinarity are, 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 are good ones. I think the reality is, is that the bureaucracies we create are, are, have been molded to get us to where we are today, right? So the reason that we haven't invested in these things, the reason we don't have policies is because we've designed a system that doesn't want to address these things. And so, yes, we can use the Fish and Wildlife Service or the uh, Customs and Border Patrol or NIH. These are all existing bureaucracies that can do it, but we need, we need a congressional mandate. You know, these organizations are happening and are operating on congressional mandates. And so without those mandates, they're going to continue to see this. And we even see this with CITES. So CITES has been mentioned several times. CITES is charged with preventing trade in endangered wildlife. And the head of CITES has said, we have no mandate to address zoonoses. Well, that means there's really no one who, I mean, there's the OIE, which is mostly focused on livestock. But there's, you know, we're asking to look at wildlife trade. There's, you know, who's in, we have the WHO for human health, we have the OID for livestock, livestock health. There's no organization for dealing with this issue. And CITES is limited by its mandate. And they're very clear, we are not funded, nor are we charged with dealing with zoonotic disease emergence. So one of the things that needs to happen is we need government leaders to mandate these organizations to do it. I don't know that creating new organizations is a solution to this problem. I think being very clear Someone alluded to the Coons Grand Bill, which um, we don't have time to talk about, but you know, we should not expect organizations that have been asked to do something else to do what we ask of them now without being told that they need to do it. 
and and the example, oh, sorry. I was say the example of of what happens when we fail to do that is how we ended up with the monkeypox outbreak is that no one had regulatory authority over importation of rodents and that it didn't fall into agriculture it wasn't considered it certainly wasn't a public health issue and and so we end up being reactionary to all of these things that after the outbreak happens suddenly there's new regulation let's be proactive let's think about how we can prevent these things from happening by working together in our policy statements and considering human animal and e ecosystem health simultaneously Thank you very much. Um, you have all been really wonderful and eye-opening. I'm really sorry. I know that we could continue talking all day, but we are at time. And so we need to end it here. Thanks to everyone who joined. Um, thanks especially to our panelists, Dr. Johnson Walker, Dr. Watson, and Dr. Bernstein. We will be following up with all of the attendees with a recording of today's presentation. And in the meantime, please feel free to reach out to me if you have questions or would like to get into contact with any of our panelists. And again, thank you all very much for your time. Bye. <laughs>